I'm really interested in this topic because I've done some Asian movements, more Qigong than Aikido, mm -hmm. but I haven't really developed it into a regular practice. Um, and so Excellent. I'm really interested. I have a friend who's actually, her husband is very active in Aikido and she's, she and her daughter also are, and they have a newly, a relatively newly formed Domo, Domo Center or whatever the right thing would be. <laughs> a, a dojo? Yeah. Um, yeah. Up in the White Bear area near where I'm on the board of an arts group. And oh, so I'm just talking with her about the whole thing. And I know she would be interested, but she's in a different meeting today. Um, so I'll send her the link. And I, I suspect she's very curious. Um, you would like her. She's a, a free walk thinker. But um, anyway, I, I'm real interested in, in how you would take the sort of systematic, self-reflective and physical ac action of Aikido and transform it into a, a sort of a human development, be better in every moment sort of thing, which is kind of what I took away from your brief comments about it the other day. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so it's, um, as, a, as a marker for the call, it's Friday, February 8th, 2019. This is an Inside Jerry's Brain call. Our topic at hand is Aikido, which is a, a coining of mine. Uh, I built a baby website, so if you go to upkido.com, you'll see the starts of uh, what I hope will become a place where we, you know, we and whoever else is attracted to this can figure out what this is and maybe practice it uh, in different ways. And I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what practice it means, because when you do Aikido, there is a practice. You go to the dojo and you work out for an hour at a time, and there's a particular pattern to it. There's a warm-up, then there's pairwise exercise, so you're always working out with somebody else. Uh, but let me... Um, let me do a screen share and just walk through the website just to um, basically show what that looks like. So here's the website in Google Sites, which I'm basically building out. So, but let me go to the, the finished product uh, at upkito.com. And I don't know why the URL aliasing isn't working properly on the site, but there we go. <clears throat> so this kind of, um, the web, this, cover page tries to tell the story that Upkido is Aikido plus this idea of upward spiral or uplift. And that Aikido is a defensive martial art uh, that is known, uh, hey Mike, how you doing? I'm just, uh, just adding in. Um, so Aikido is a defensive martial art that's noticed for sort of blending with your attacker's energy and then neutralizing uh, them either through a pin or a throw. That's typically what Aikido is all about. Uh, o Sensei, Morihei Ueshiba, the guy who's in the video below, um, uh, was really about peacekeeping. He, uh, he learned a whole series of different styles uh, from jujitsu to a variety of others uh, and evolved from them this notion of Aikido partly as a way to prevent conflict. So it, 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 there's very much the ethos in Aikido that you're not an a, a attacker or assailant, but that you're trying to slow things down and that the worst of all things is conflict. Um, and it's funny because most martial arts seem to attract alpha males who want to hurt other alpha males. Uh, Aikido is not. Aikido attracts men and women uh, who want to learn to do something that seems sort of spiritual, definitely physical, probably useful in a defensive kind of way, uh, et cetera. So, uh, so it's, it's pretty interesting. And I did... I did a couple years of Aikido uh, when I was in Berkeley, living in Berkeley. I, I went to a, a dojo called Berkeley Aikikai that it turns out uh, is the parent, uh, in some sense, of the dojo where I go now here in Portland. So I, I returned after a 10-year absence. I basically found a dojo that was really close to home, went to it, and discovered that the two founders of this dojo studied under uh, the sensei, Shibata sensei, who runs Berkeley Aikikai. So, so, so... Partly I'm, I'm bringing Aikido forward here because I'm involved in it and really enjoying the involvement. And Aikido is used often as a metaphor. So you'll, if you go on YouTube and you know, look up talks, you'll find some people who are basically talking about um, Aikido uh, strategies and uh, you know, this, this notion of blending and, and circular motions and so forth. And I'll, I'll come back to more about Aikido, but I, I embedded a video here. <laughs> hey Ken, good to see you. Um, I embedded a, a video here uh, of, of O Sensei basically uh, taking on uh, students, uh, attackers are called uke, uh, and, uh, which is basically uh, 
ukemi is the art of taking a fall, and uke is attacking, but it's going to be thrown or pinned. So you'll see a series of moves, and it's actually this, this video, even though it's back in 1935, is a reasonable uh, exposure to, to what Aikido is like. So that, that's, a, that's a side of it, um, which is about peacekeeping, and here, I know it's a martial art, it's about combat, it's about you know, samurai and bushido and all those kinds of things. So what's that got to do with improving everything we touch? So now let me marry that with this other concept of uplift or upward spiral. And uh, uplift, I don't mean uplift in the David Brin science fiction author sense of it so much where uh, he is saying, how do we uplift dolphins to be smarter than humans kind of thing. He, he basically had a, a couple books where uplift was about improving, you know, different species uh, uh, capacities, basically giving them superpowers. Mike, did you want to jump in about Bryn? I did. Did you see his latest post about no. how the human species seems to have uplifted itself? No, uh, I've not seen this. There's a really interesting article that he dug up by some German, German sociologists. And the contention is that just in the last 100,000, 200,000 years, uh, or even less, probably since the start of agriculture and city-states and kings, there's been this real strong selection pressure against homicidal maniacs. Homicidal really maniacs were very useful when there were tribal cultures and it was hunter-gatherer and you had to take control of animal grazing lands from the other guy. But according to this work, and it's based on some interesting observations in pre-agricultural societies, as well as just looking at history, and it, it, it's, it's speculative, but fascinating. The idea that we've tamed, tamed ourselves, both mm -hmm. because the kings had absolute power, and if somebody was getting out of control and hurting other warriors, people that were needed to defend the clan, it was better to get just get rid of that person. So the king would just, you know, cut off the head of the somebody before they procreate. <laughs> And at the same time, according to this theory, the, the, there is sexual selection from the female side. Um, Not wanting to uh, mate with somebody who might get themselves killed very quickly. Right, right. So it was an uplift. I mean, he, he referenced his own books. He said this is uh, mankind uplifting him and herself. I did not, I, I don't have my eyes on the chat right now, but if you can put the, if you could find the link and put it in the chat, that would be great. I will and, do that. and I want to come back to the conversation about tribes and violence and, and things like that. Uh, again, for Inside Jerry's Brain and other things, because there's a couple of books that have affected me a lot on that. And, and just one tiny side note I'll put there is that a lot of combat, a lot of tribal combat is very much show and isn't very lethal. Um, it was it was really quite interesting. It was it was sort of a, about the ritualization of combat, and it might be uh, oh, what's it called? Single. Uh, I think it's called single combat, where you send a representative forward, and whether that person wins or loses against the other person's champion determines the battle, as opposed to a thousand people dying on the battlefield kind of thing. That happened a bunch. Things of things of that nature. But but let me come back here so I can fold upward spiral into the concept of upkeeto. Um, so Arthur, Arthur Brock, um, I, certifiable genius, uh, Arthur Brock, who has done agile learning centers and uh, game shifting and Holochain and uh, the Meta Currency Project and a bunch of other things. Years ago, he sent me a, a, a link to a video, not the video I've embedded here, because the original video, I think, disappeared. Um, but it was a really lousy quality VHS video of this very, very quiet guy who was walking around the hillsides uh, of Northern California, sort of central Northern California, with a trowel, with a hand trowel. And he was walking into the hills and paying attention to how water came off the hill. And he noticed that if water collects a lot, it cuts a gully into the hill. And then the gully starts to separate the hill and then water drains off the hill instead of staying up high. So one of his strategies was follow the water up and then block, dam the water a bit so that it spreads high on the hill. 
And when the, the hill is retaining moisture up high, plants, trees, everything grow uh, more vigorously, et cetera. So through that action and, and a couple other kinds of principles like that, but being observant about nature and helping nature do things. And if you think about it for a second, um, what beavers do uh, is, is kind of that same action. They, they dam water, which then sort of spreads out in an area uh, and creates a different ecosystem than there was there before. So um, Crayful and, 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 upward, and, and his work in the hills of Northern California was lonely work with a trowel. This was not social work. And yet his simple single actions were busy lifting up uh, that entire environment. So he has film of you know, some area that he goes back to and it gets greener and lusher and anim more, more animals and so forth. And then a couple months, and I haven't put this on the website here, but I, I will, a couple months after that, I happened to cross uh, uh, some videos of the Lowe's Plateau um, in China. And, and uh, Lowe's is basically very loose, um, friable soil. It's actually, the word is loose. It's a German word. Uh, and there's a Lowe's Plateau, which is the size of Belgium in the middle of China. And I happened to cross uh, basically... Uh, a video by a guy named John Liu who had gone to the Los Plateau when it was a, basically a dust bowl. And because this is very erosive soil, there were huge dust storms in Beijing and, and you know, downwind of the Los Plateau was a mess because the soil was basically blowing away. Uh, and everything, everybody was leaving, you know, there were sort of kids going to school, but, but uh, grown-ups were just leaving the area because you couldn't grow anything or do anything. And the Chinese government employed the villagers and uh, paid them to first stop free range uh, grazing their goats because goats will eat anything and too many goats on a landscape will eat the grass down to where it just doesn't regenerate and you're done. Uh, so they, they, they paid them to pen up their goats and feed them in the pens. And they paid them to go with shovels and go up into the hillsides and do terracing and plant trees up high on the hillsides and a bunch of other things. So at a very large scale, a scale that maybe only China is capable of doing, the, 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 the citizens of the Los Plateau did something very similar to what Crayful had been doing by himself in Northern California. And Liu then documents that over 10 years, this area re-greens. It becomes verdant. Uh, people start growing crops successfully. The hills are all covered in green. And my favorite thing is at the end of that documentary, he interviews a woman who says, hey, you know, 10 years ago, I was making 600 yuan a year and life was really, really tough here. Now my apples are doing really well and I'm making 6,000 yuan a year. Um, and so those two things were kind of my, my, my wake up about different scales of activity where if you pay attention to nature, you can intentionally improve it. So, uh, so at some point I had this idea, why don't I sort of just point a term up keto and make a little experiment out of it and figure out what the practices of up keto might look like. So how might we, um, what sorts of things might we do so that uh, we improve the things that we touch? So the, the, the question here at the top is how might we improve everything we touch? <clears throat> and and I think this is a complicated question. This is not a really simple question because I'm from the government and I'm here to help is people trying to improve things, but often fails, right? Uh, also, uh, one of the lessons I've had is that if you're not listening um, to what actually matters on the ground and what people care about and what they're good at and what, you know, and so forth, you can't impose on them some better way of doing things that, that, you know, how might we improve everything we touch involves actually serving and listening and not coming in with the better answer or the best practice. And I see uh, I, I, a couple, uh, a decade ago, I attended a conference called Opportunity Collaboration twice. It's basically a, a meet and greet for three days uh, at a resort in Mexico, kind of ironically. Half the people who attend are funders, foundations, family foundations, looking for good social ventures to invest in. The other half have interesting social ventures that are doing good around the world. And out of all the social ventures that showed up at OpCall, I discovered one whose MO was we arrive in a village and we go talk and listen. And we say, what do you need? And we don't show up with like the solution. You just have to install this water driven, this pump that looks like a merry-go-round that kids will power and everything will be fine. We actually came in and listen. And at one point they wanted a soccer field. And we're like, 
don't you really need a hospital? I'm like, no, 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 we need a soccer field. And it turned out that the soccer field got the kids out of trouble and off the streets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so part of, I think, up, uh, up keto practice is, is deep listening and there's a variety of things like that. So on the website, I created a little page for uh, practices where I've just put a couple of, of uh, starting points. But what I'd love to do is, and also in my brain, uh, of course, I've got a bunch of uh, resources around up keto, which I will share as our conversation uh, deepens. But what I'd love to do is just sort of stop there and uh, see what you think, because uh, this is either, oh good, Christina's here. I didn't even see you come in. Woohoo! Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Christina shares my enthusiasm for Aikido as well. Um, sure, I, so I want to give just a little context there. I lived in a dojo for a year and a half in San Francisco, training 13 hours a week, and went to Japan, got my black belt, and it's been a huge part of my life. So, so you are way deeper into it than am I, and, and, and love that. Thank you. Um, so let me go quiet for a second and just see what your first thoughts are. I will take notes in the chat. I'm now reading the chat because when I'm screen sharing, it's hard for me to see the chat. So I'm, uh, I'm glimpsing over there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you put the link to the page you were just showing? In the yes. Chat? Um, it, that is in fact at upketo.com, which I own. Um, <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's a Google site. So it's super easy for me to give anybody uh, right access if you'd like to go in and, and mess with it. Um, and I'm, you know, part of, part of the idea here is to co-construct a practice of Upketo. And uh, uh, you're muted. It's giving me an error. Oh, that's weird. Upketo.com is, uh, can anybody else go see Upketo.com? Looks like it's loading on mine. I don't have the page up yet. I get a 404. Yeah, that's bad. I get a Google 404 also. All right, let me, um, well, I just changed the setting. Hmm. Let me force You can fix on. it later, I can look at it later. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so actually, let me, um, let me give you the Google Sites link on the chat. Oops, I'm going to the wrong page. Place. Let me give you the Google Sites links and tell me if that works right there. Mm, also getting a 404. The redirect worked on the first one. So that's the same URL that the first one, when I clicked up, up keto.com, it showed me the sites.google. Oh, but the Google Sites is not publishing for you, which is very weird. Publish settings. Thank you for sharing. Well, I'll, <laughs> pardon? Yeah, sorry. I'll figure this out and make sure it works. That's, this is unusual because usually the Google Sites thing works quite transparently and works quite well. Um, so my apologies. So why don't I screen share what I had just for a moment again. And then, um, so here's the, here's the site in Google Sites where I have Aikido is Aikido plus Upward Spiral. And then I described for a while um, why Aikido is interesting here and the principles of Aikido are interesting. And then where this notion of Upward Spiral showed up in my life uh, through Arthur Brock. And the, the marriage of those two things, I think, is uh, interesting as a subject of a practice, as a, something that humans might do individually and together. And the question then is, like, what do we do? And uh, so I created on the practices page, I set up a couple of simple questions, which I think I, even, even, as, I'm, even as I'm sitting here talking about it, I'm like, oh, okay, um, I can think of, A question I like is, what are my superpowers? I think that's an interesting question to, to figure out. Um, uh, I have here, like, assume good intent, uh, think abundance instead of scarcity. Uh, which way is up is, is meant to be kind of a, a question about uplift, up keto, upward spiral. If we're trying to improve somebody, how do we make sure we do that with their consent and participation and from them, not to them? 
right? So that's what that's what this which way is up uh, kind of question means. And I'll, again, I'll go quiet for a second and see what other things come up in your heads. Jerry, I really like this concept of, of keto. Um, it's a it's a nice play on words, and it's just got a great resonance to it for many reasons for me. Um, I'm not an Aikido practitioner. I'm a, I'm a Qigong practitioner. Mm -hmm. And I took uh, Otto Sharmer's four levels of listening from uh, Theory U and tied them to a breath practice. So um, I have people in my, when I work with them in, in workshops or if I'm teaching courses inside of companies, have them start out by putting their hands really high in their chest and breathing just into, you know, into the palm of their hand very it's shallow and rapid, so it makes them kind of dizzy, and it, it gets them. This is Char, our Sharmer's first level of um, uh, downloading. Most people don't breathe very deeply. They might breathe a little bit more deeply than I do there. It's kind of intentionally exaggerated. But that's the breath for um, just listening for, okay, we're, we're in agreement. I don't have to think very hard. You know, it's, it's all fine. If someone comes along, though, and says, no, I see things differently. I disagree with you. We've got to be more in our bodies. So I have them drop their hand to their solar plexus, breathe there. And that's the breath for when someone comes along and says, hey, I have a different opinion, so we can be more grounded in our bodies. Then the third breath is putting their hands on their hara and breathing there, which is the empathic breath, which drops us out of paying attention to the content and really listening for how is it for this person? What is the, how is it the world struck for them? What's important to them? What are their values? What do they, what do they care about? And then the last breath is a combination of the first and the, and the third, which is you breathe from your hara all the way up, filling the belly first, filling the entire torso with breath. And that's what I call the enlivening breath of if the future is born in the present moment, there's always something we're talking about that is trying to be born, that's, that's keeping us alive here. So what is, what's enlivening? You know, what's happening here that wants to grow and, and move between us? And oftentimes that's something that can be really hard to discern because it's really subtle. And other times it's something that is immediately apparent because someone says something and the hair on the back of your neck goes up or you find yourself leaning forward, you know, and it's like, okay, that's, you know, let's grab onto that. And after I teach this practice, I have people get into pairs or trios and share a personal story. Like I'll say, you know, introduce a mentor of yours when you were a young child and, um, uh, someone who, who really impressed you and you're still to this day carrying forward, you know, a lesson from them or a challenge that you're having. I do this with some clergy people and I have them uh, talk about, you know, what's a challenge my congregation is having. And the listener's job is to listen from their bellies and to not pay attention to content so much, but really see how am I responding on a, on a somatic level to this person? And what always happens in every case is that people come forward with the most incredible stories of, wow, you know, I, I, one man said, I'm from the aha, uh aha, -huh, aha uh -huh, uh -huh school of listening. And when I did that, I stopped doing that. And I really heard this person differently. Another man said, I'm so used to having to problem solve all the time. I was like, wow, I'm glad I don't have that problem. And then I could actually say, and I feel how challenging it must be. And, and, you know, so this very simple process of listening from the body rather than from the head um, and using breath as an anchor so that if you find yourself getting caught up in the story, put your hand on your belly and breathe deeply, really challenges people in, in, in very productive ways. And I found that it, um, it helps them to, to have better conversations. So I don't build myself as a conspiracy theorist. If you know the root of conspiracy is to breathe together. So my theory is you have better conversations by, by breathing deeply and listening. So I invite you to prove my theory. Um, and I will uh, add that I ha I'm extremely grateful to an early girlfriend uh, who at one point said, because I'm like a guy and very analytic and love to solve stuff. And, and, and she said, look, I don't need you to fix this. I just need you to hear me. And, and my whole world sort of like shook because I was like, wait, what? I'm, I'm doing my best with the thing I do really well. I'm coming in and trying to fix this. And it's like, no, 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 that, That's entirely not what's at hand here. It doesn't really work. Christina, over to you in the booth. <laughs> it's so good to meet you, Ken. And that's actually, I, I've done, I had somebody teach me the, the iron, iron jacket or iron shirt, Shigong. 
So I've done a little bit, he called it the body, like just doing this like intense practice for a while. And I was doing that in college. So I have some experience with Qigong and of course it ties all into Aikido and um, that, that what you said about when people disagree with you and the, what you feel in your body, there's this really interesting practice called um, tr trauma release exercises. You're familiar with the, the shape you get your legs weak and you shake. Yeah. There's so that there's something there with what exercises. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Jerry, this, this ties into a question of um, how do we actually release organizational trauma of being like in hierarchical systems for a long time. So I have a question for the group of like, given the, the, the lots of lots of agreeing that we're doing with each other, can we actually ask questions we don't know the answer to and get into something where we're not agreeing with each other, where we actually have some ideas we're at the edge of knowledge? And for me in that, my question is around releasing organizational traumas where people are coming up against um, the need to take responsibility and self-organization, the, the angst that comes out in teamwork when, when there's unacknowledged power dynamics, all of that, like that's a huge big tangle for an individual. I actually think that if everybody would listen to Ken and just be a conspiracy theorist, the whole world would solve itself. But We're there's, done. All there's I have a, to do is, uh, all we have to do is hang a portrait of Ken in the hall of the dojo for a keto. No, seriously, if everybody all, would just stand up straight and breathe, so much would get fixed, including myself. Like I find, I go, you know, like, in all sorts of like if everybody just paid attention to that posture and breath a lot of the world's trauma would go away how do you implement that somatic experience in organizational team dynamics where so many people are not comfortable dropping into their body because they're in a team in a work environment absolutely absolutely um, so there's a piece here, which is, a, which is about listening, receiving. I, I typed the word grace into the chat because one of the, one of, it's kind of one of my favorite words because you, you can't, you don't know a lot about people until they're under pressure somehow. Um, and the grace with which they act under pressure is a big tell. That's, a, that's a really important. And trying to develop more grace so that Kind of, no matter how bad the situation is coming along, you can, you can be calm and deal with it. And, and partly, being able to be calm allows you to see more of what's happening. You're, you're, you know, it, when, you, when you go into the fear response and adrenaline spikes and cortisol spikes and your attention span narrows and et cetera, um, that changes your physiological ability to deal with a, a particular situation and it alerts the other party that you are now in fight, flight, or freeze response or something like that, right? So one of the things I love about Aikido practice is that when you're in the middle of a pretty complicated move that has like three or four different kinds of steps and you need to get the energy right and you need to get the hold just right and so forth, but then you're doing it and you're repeating it over and over again with your partner and you're in the middle of it looking around going, hmm, this is going pretty well. I just adjust, adjusted this thing over here and that got better and there's, there's limbs flying, but you feel calm because you kind of know what's up and what's where, right? And that's a kind of grace. That's a, that, 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 that gives you, it gives you calm in a fight in a sense, which is important because we have all, so, all sorts of kinds of fights. And, and I love also that Christina brought up sort of uh, different kinds of organizational or institutional trauma uh, because there, there's lots of layers of it. Right, and we never point to it. We don't deal with it. We don't give people some outlet to to discuss it, uh, and yet it's in there um, all the time. Uh, Judy, off to you. Well, I wanted to respond to Christina's question first of all, endorse enthusiastically being at the edge of what we don't know, because that's what I find most fascinating about these calls, and. Um, sort of re remarkable food for subsequent reflection after I leave the call and pondering. Um, but one of the questions I think that's hard in organizational issues is that there's a lot of ingrained guarding, many times decades of, of experience of guarding who you really are. And all you can really do, I think, is invite people to a different space. They, they really, they can, do the 
you can encourage them to take a pause and reflect and see what's going on. I've tried a lot of different things, but it's, it's challenging from an external because the change is internal. And so I, I like the somatic process that we're talking about here, because if a person stops to breathe or stops to reflect on any question that's not the one that's creating the distress, that seems to help them move to a better space. And it works for me, at least. If I notice my own reactions that I'm getting in this zone of I'm about to become contentious, which, of course, it took me years to learn that I could predict that behavior, <laughs> um, then there are certain things I can do in terms of breathing and reflection that assist in staying in the space I want to be in instead of the one that's reactive. Christina? I disagree. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I love what you said about guarding and the habit of guarding. I think that's super what happens. But I disagree that the only thing you can do is invite people. You can throw them. <laughs> if we're going to be, seriously, that's how you make a noodle uke. So, or, when, okay, there's, when people step on the mat in Aikido. So my job in a dojo, when I was living in a dojo, was as an uchideshi. So, uh, an uchi deshi is a really weird position because you have no rank. You literally don't have rank because your learning curve when you're being thrown that much is so much off the diff. It's like you could get all like, yeah, I'm the uchi deshi. And so you are literally above everybody and below everybody at the same time. You're responsible for the dust on the top of a picture frame if the sensei decides to get mad at you. And it's a really hierarchical, weird position because you're in this rigid Japanese hierarchy from ages of samurai but you're also above and below everybody because you have absolute access to the top senseis when they come in, but you're washing their feet. Does that make sense? I'm trying to explain so, it in the chat. So there's, yeah, 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 exactly. So your responsibility, like all of your other responsibilities at Tsuchideshi go away when there's a new student. And when there's a new student stepping on the mat, your, your only focus as Deshi is to make sure that they get integrated and learn. Because when you come into Aikido Dojo, there's not like ranked classes, everybody's training together. And that white belt who's brand new, who just put on the gi for the first day, um, is it's your responsibility that they don't get hurt. So that comes before everything. And making sure, uh, what, what you learn when you're working with a lot of white belts is number one, there's, there's people that come in who, when you grab onto them, are very noodly. They, they just, they kind of like let you do whatever and they don't have any tension in them at all. And they're just, they're kind of a little passive. And then you come into what you're talking about in organizations, which are guarded, really rigid, that like it's hard to move them. And of course, what you're looking for, and every once in a while, a white, a white belt will step on the mat who already has this feeling what you're looking for is Gumby, right? Of like this resilient, rubbery, I'm gonna move with you, but I'm in my center and all of that. And Judith, what I really wanted to say to this group in this context about organizations is there's something there about, everybody thinks of Aikido in this framework when they're, when they're just exploring it and just beginning to learn, they're really focused on how do I do this technique? But what is actually where the learning happens is being thrown because that's when you feel what the sensei is doing. You feel what the, the sort of kinesthetic idea of the muscles, you feel what's happening, you feel what's going. And that's where the learning gets transferred. And when you're uchi dashi, you're being the uke for white belts. And so as you're falling is when you're learning, I mean, it's when you're teaching. As you're falling, you're showing them how to throw, right? By the way that you fall or don't fall, if they don't have it quite, you kind of stand there. And then when they're throwing you, you are protecting them and putting them up against the edge of their uncomfortableness. And there's something there that is really different, which is why I said I disagreed, than just inviting people to learn to breathe. There's, there's, a, there's a willingness to go in and and be in conflict and confront these things that organizations so often put under the rug. And, and my, my own 
working theory going into this is that there's, there's a repertory of options. And what I want to do is, is spread a, a, a delightful smorgasbord in front of anybody who shows up <clears throat> that says, here's a, a bunch of, of things you might try. And here's where they might take you. And here's a path. And here's a bunch of people who are helpfully, help, helpful to, happy to help you pick a path through these things. Um, and, and Mike, I'm struck that uh, the, the great wave off Kanagawa is over your shoulder in the image, which is, seems apropos somehow. <laughs> um, I like that. Um, but trying to figure out, um, I think there's sort of a, a, a behavioral repertory that we sometimes forget exists. We kind of get locked into, we get habituated to our own responses to situations, et, et cetera. Um, one of my favorite um, psychologists, therapists ever in the world is Milton Erickson, um, whose story I've told a little bit, I think on another uh, uh, Inside Jerry's Brain call. <clears throat> but Milton basically had polio when he was very young and was laid out for a year and a half. And his family was pretty cool. They would bring him out and play around him. And he got extremely perceptive at reading skin tone, tone of voice, uh, skin color, you know, emotion, so that he could, he could see what people's emotions were uh, in the family. And then um, he got polio again as an adult, which permanently locked, uh, left him in a wheelchair with, with pain, which he managed with hypnosis. I'm telling the full story because his approach was our unconscious is, or subconscious or whatever you want to call it, even what we call it is a little controversial. Um, our subconscious is always on duty, always trying to do the right thing for us. It's often wrong. It's often extremely wrong. He was trying to use hypnosis to open a conversation with that unconscious to give it a wider variety of behaviors, more opportunity to do something fruitful at that moment when the terror was striking because the person is afraid of crossing a bridge or whatever phobias or whatever was going on for the person. Uh, so I, I like that. And, and when I talk about sort of laying out a smorgasbord or, or creating different kinds of, of behavioral opportunities, um, that's kind of where I'm going for that is, is I, I can see that a bunch of people would hear what Ken described earlier about breath work and go, yes, 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 let's go, let's go. And then a bunch of people would be like, breath work, I'm out of here. And so how do I get that breath work, I'm out of here person to find something here that they click with and give it a, give it a whirl, right? Give it a whirl. And, and for example, one, one thing I found was uh, it's called lean coffee. Uh, so if you, if you, I, I've got links to it in my brain, I can share, but um, I'm a big fan of open space, which is a self-organizing meeting format. I'm a trained in how to do it by the guy who invented open space. I've run multiple open spaces, love doing it. It's kind of a big deal. You've got to like prep and all that. Lean coffee is baby open space done with post-it notes in a room that is posing as a lean uh, technique. And people who do out agile and lean are not necessarily the ones who will show up and go, ooh, breath work, awesome. They're very often sort of geeks, type A's, alphas, who really want to get things done. And lean coffee is a very efficient way to run a little meeting because it lets everybody's voice get heard. There's timers involved. You're moving through the meeting very quickly. And lean coffee is a sneaky way of doing open space and getting a taste of the shared power and responsibility of being in open space. Because one of the things I love about open space is that I didn't create the agenda for who's the most famous person who's going to give the keynote talk and what the panels are going to be. We all figured it out because we all have that genius and capacity to do it. So, so um, that's a, an example of what I call design from trust. Uh, so how do we find practices like lean coffee and just point to them? We don't have to invent them. We don't have to uh, whatever. That, there's a, a nice video I can, I can put on a list on the resource page on a keto that says, hey, here's a way of trying out this thing we're trying to get toward. And, and, and again, how do we describe the things we're trying to get toward? That's maybe where the practice is, is heading. Judith, you have your hand raised. Well, I guess maybe I said the use the wrong word or the interpretation of the word is different. When I say invitation, I guess where I'm coming from is that each person is responsible for their own space. They're sitting in a room with 12 other people. You can observe that the room is really guarded. As a leader, I have certain things I can do or not do. But ultimately, the trick is to figure out how to invite each person into his or her space to be reflective. And so um, 
exploring different ways of doing that, some of which are easier to do one-on-one -on -one than they are in a conference setting with people. But if you can interrupt the dynamic of the conference group with anything that causes the individual to have to think, it'll get over some of their primal reaction and their resistance and other things. And then they can perhaps uh, be more open to hearing another person with a different point of view. Because I'm usually focusing on a group of people. It's mm -hmm. pretty easy. It's much easier in a one-on-one -on -one to do these kinds of things. And, and it's easier to share one's own approaches and give people opportunities to explore their approaches and so on. Agreed. Christina, please. I'll be very quick, but I, I disagree again. I'm so glad. <laughs> okay. So it, it's not, it's just, the only thing I disagree about is that is the line of invitation is not around personal space or personal comfort. It's being willing to step on the mat. So once you're stepping on the mat, you're exploring conflict, right? That's the whole Aikido is about dialogue and conflict and how to resolve that peacefully. So being willing to step on the mat is giving permission for people to come in and push you off your center. And so having a framework organizationally where you're explicitly saying, we are going to get into each other's personal space. I'm going to have you like up in my armpit and over my hip and like that whole thing by stepping on the mat is giving consent. And then your personal space can be invaded in this safe space that you're in. And, and hi, so Robert analogy, and Kevin. And Kevin, yeah. So by analogy, how does that carry over into, let's say, a workplace? Because there's not a mat in the office. Oh, you can make a mat as a facilitator of a, of a group. Uh huh. You just make a space that you're like, here is where we're going. We are explicitly looking under the rug, right? There's a lot of stuff under there. It's going to scare you. We're safe. You make a, you make a mat with the framing of a what's facilitator. Really, what's really interesting is that Ken, the, the, Ken mat, is the, the mat is padding, which is a form of safety, right? So. So the mat says, when you get thrown, once we teach you how to land, which is really important, really important. So uke is the attacker, but is going to be thrown. So ukemi is the art of knowing how to take a fall, how to land in Aikido. It's called ukemi. And so doing good ukemi is super important. And you just get better and better at it over time, which makes you more flexible and stronger because uh, I think so. Um, so. So I think the perception but, of a mat- But then mat you get old. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Then you get inflexible and, and, and cranky and all that. But the perception of there being a mat, I, I'm really interested metaphorically in what that feels like in a work setting, for example. So Ken, then Kevin. So there's so many things I want to comment on. I'll try to keep this Excellent. contained. Yeah, chat too. <laughs> um, to, to Judy, I, I also disagree about getting people to think. I want them to get out of cogn cognition and into somatic experiencing. So um, uh, one interesting way that I've discovered to do this comes from a friend of mine over in Europe who does constellation work where he has people do a random walk and just stop next to somebody and say, okay, so close your eyes and, and stand shoulder to shoulder, close your eyes. Now feel, what is it like to be standing next to this person? Do you feel bigger? Do you feel taller? Do you feel smaller? Do you feel safe? Do you feel threatened? Do you feel warmly disposed towards them? Do you want to move away from them, Right. And just really sense your body, what, what information you're getting. Now, the person who's standing on the left of, you know, person A, move to the other side and repeat the process. And it is amazing what happens when you move from one side of a person to another, because we all have electromagnetic magnetic charges. And sometimes just simply moving from standing on someone's right to their left will completely change the dynamic of interactivity. He actually pointed out to me that he, he worked with two brothers who inherited a family corporation. They were constantly at each other's throats. And once they did this practice, they decided they did, need to change chairs at the table. And as soon as they did that, they started to work together really effectively, much more so than they had been. So there's, my thing is there's so much intelligence available to us that doesn't come through thinking about, you know, we spend too much time on thinking. We, we, we rely on it too much. So I'm trying to open people up to different dimensions of intelligences and knowing in ways that are often uncomfortable. I get a lot of pushback when I do the breath work from engineers and type A people. And I often work with IT people. So 
I lead them through the process. I model it first, and I'm a really good breather when I'm standing there after 15 years of Qigong practice, and I breathe that whole room breathes with me, and then I say, now do it with me. So I entrain them in that way. And I still get folks who are like, yeah, not so much for me. But I've had far more people say, when you first brought this up, I was very skeptical. But once I experienced it, I recognized that it really did help to ground me and enlarge my center and give me new ways of, of accessing things. So I stick with it, and, and it's, it's been extremely well received. And the last thing is when I do have them pair up or, or work in trios, the listeners can't respond with anything other than what they felt or what they sensed. So they can't say, that reminds me of the story about my uncle. You know, They've got to come with, as you were telling that story, my stomach was in knots, or I was really, I, was, I just wanted to grab you, or I was want to move around. You know? And, and it's a, it opens up a different vocabulary, a different way of relating. I'm complete, thank you. Uh, Kevin, then Christina. And you're muted, Kevin. Okay, so yeah, you know, the first thing you said when it's a mat, I was wondering if I could bring a weapon, you know, um, that's just, you know, I have old warrior shit, whatever, that's just the first response, it's like, you know, well, if I'm in a fight, you know, what can I bring? Bring it. You know, yeah, yeah exactly. And so then I said, well, okay, I'll be you know, trying to be more, you know, collaborative, like Ken's being here and be, be nicey and shit, you know. And uh, it reminded me actually just in the way of knowing of Cornelius Clemens, who's a guy that really kind of, I modeled a lot of my discovery process on, I built software around and built businesses around. He was a, he was a black illiterate guy who was a water witcher. Uh, and uh, it turned out that he was discovered by the Texas Eastern Pipeline going through and there was ways that he could listen to water that would help them know where gas was. And so by doing that, you know, he's, they started, he got these long pool cue holders for his willow wand, wands and they would fly in business class up to Canada. And he put his daughters through school and he said, you know, tell me about your, you know, the way you think. He said, well, you know, if I'd been full up with letters, you know, I couldn't have listened to the water. So he thought his illiteracy is, is what gave him the ability to put his daughters through school because there, his, his only asset was his uh, unique ability to know everything about water you couldn't see for quite a ways down. Uh, and he, he could go deeper than other dowsers too. He, he was more sensitive. And, uh, but he just said, you know, th thank God I never learned to read, you know. Wouldn't have had room in my brain for the way I think. So he was, he was a wise man who, who was proud of being illiterate. And, and his, his kids went to college because he was illiterate. That's really interesting. And, and there's this fascinating series of layers of framing of socialization and training and things like literacy and how they affect our brains. Uh, another one of my favorite books is Leonard Schlein's book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, where he has this pretty out there um, thesis that the linear alphabet basically destroys the divine feminine around the world. And then he follows this culture after culture and he goes to Greece and he says, hey, pre-alphabetic Greece, the birth story of the culture is Diana, the huntress, who's like, you know, badass. And uh, there, there's like uh, this sort of Bacchus, uh, Dionysus. Those are the stories of, of sort of pre-alphabetic uh, Greece. And then you get the alphabet and then suddenly you have uh, men giving birth from their forehead and their thigh. Uh, the women are deprecated, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that, so anyway. But there's a whole series of, of digressions that are interesting and sort of uh, uh, food for later conversations there. Let me uh, go quiet again and see who else wanted to jump into the conversation. Uh, Christina. Christina, you're so, you're so quiet on this call. I'm kind of worried that, that your introversion is really showing through. I, I'll shut up in a second. No, um, I don't want you to. I, I, I want to ask Ken a quick um, question. I love the, the idea, Kevin, of uh, illiteracy as an asset and, and like people being proud of that. That's really sort of socially transformative. Um, but the, um, when you're talking about groups, constellation practice, all of these different ways to get in their heads. So the, the, the group that I work with, the Digital Life Collective, um, where Jerry and Robert also are, so chime in. Um, is confronting all the problems. We're a distributed co-op. Some of my closest, dearest friends I've never met in person. 
Um, we're virtual, we're all over the world, we have time zone problems, and it's always these faces on Zoom. So how do you bring this embodiment into the virtual space before we have the VR capabilities, which will come eventually, I, I am sure that eventually I'm gonna be able to like do Qigong practice with Philip in a hologram thing and we can sit and have coffee afterwards or something like that. But right now we're not there and it's like in disembodied faces on Zoom and we're like always in this context. And I would love to break out of that somehow and I just have no idea how. Certainly conversationally we can, um, but again, you're kind of getting people to talk about feelings or respond with just how they feel would help but I'm wondering what you have to say about that. And then I will sort of shut up. Yeah, you know, I was like, if I came to a keto call, you knew it. It's awesome. Wow, thank you. That's a really intriguing and large question. And I don't know that I have anything off the top of my head that's, that's going to be brilliant, but um, I, I would actually offer the same breathing practice. I think that I was involved in integral transformative practice back in the mid nineties with George Leonard and Michael Murphy. And, you know, there's a lot of Aikido principles in there. And there's also this concept of the long body, you know, that, that um, if you're, if your group is doing a practice at the same time distributed, there's a, there's an energetic connection to that. So um, I think if you begin your calls with people actually doing some, some shared breath work exercises, that's one way to kind of sink your, get yourselves in an energetic sink. Also, um, uh, you know, we're so used to, uh, on Zoom, we see each other like this, you know, we don't see each other like this. We don't see the profiles. We don't see the back. So put your computer up somewhere and actually, you know, be able to move around. I want you to see, I'm going to turn around, see my whole body, right? So you get to, to see more dimensions <clears throat> of each other. Um, engage in, I used to meditate and uh, I discovered that if I, I couldn't sustain 45 minutes every day. And if I missed a few days, it became harder and harder to go back to the practice because I'd feel guilty. And that's like, Oh, you know, and, and um, meditation teacher, a friend of mine said, just do 21 breaths. You can always do 21 breaths. And some days you do 21 breaths and you sit for 321 breaths. And other days you do 21 breaths and get up and move on. So, starting with 21 breaths, you know, of, that's about three minutes for most folks. It's enough to quiet the mind. Articulating an intention. We recognize we are geographically separate. Let's create a shared space here of um, connection at the heart, connection at the brain, and connection at the gut. We want to we be able to sense and feel those three centers. How can we bring, what would it look like to um, hold the call where we're doing gestures rather than speech, you know, um, gestures, is the oldest language there is, right? Before we had voice boxes, we were jumping around. So these are just off the top of my head thoughts. I hope they're, they're useful to you. Um, Ken, thank you. And uh, so I've got a group uh, called Rex, the Relationship Economy Expedition that I started in 2010. And I just picked it up as a practice that every Rex call, every Rex meeting starts with a poem. And that got me reading a lot more poems. And poems have this lovely feature where people shift into a different mode when they start listening to a poem. It's sort of like an involuntary reaction. Uh, Milton Erickson was famous for his handshake induction. He would shake hands with somebody and then slowly withdraw his hand. And by the time he was detaching, the other person was in a hypnotic trance. And he was taking advantage of the fact that the handshake is such an automated process that we go into kind of an automated process frame of mind. And if you hang in there for a while, he was kind of using that as the doorway in to hypnotic induction. So for me, poems have functioned and I don't know how useful they are that way, but it feels like they're still useful. And also as a group starts getting used to it and everybody's like, oh good, we're, we're starting to meet, here comes the poem. Everybody sort of shifts a little bit and goes into it. Uh, another tiny example, in one of the early online dial-up bulletin board systems, I think uh, this was not the well, this was somewhere else, I'm forgetting where it was. Um, there was basically a little banner that went across the page that said, uh, you know, please take a moment to center yourself before entering this, this discussion. And it didn't freeze your screen. It did nothing. It, it, it just, there was just a banner that asked you to consider something before entering the online discussion. And yet it created a bit of a threshold and made the discussion inside that place a little bit different. 
So I'm interested in, in all these affordances that create thresholds that allow us to be in a different space. Ken, I really love that you keep bringing into this, we need to get out of this thing, out of our heads and into our, our senses. So I'm, 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 I'm hearing you and I'm feeling it. Um, so let, let's see where that goes. Uh, Kevin, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just have to say, um, I left my phone on BART today, which has my uh, driver's license, my credit card, my ATM, and my um, room key. But I'm at Whoa. the hub, and I, I've, I've got my son FedExing my passport to the hotel, and uh, I can eat at the hotel, and they'll recognize me. And I've got my cards canceled, and I'm, I'm not panicking and going through my day. Even, like, when it went away, it was like... <laughs> Oh my God. And I've talked to the guy. Luckily I had my clipper card in my bag and it's a, uh, you know, so I can't call anybody until I go to the hotel. And so anyway, uh, but I'm being normal and, and, and taking my meetings, you know, in person here at the hub uh, this morning and being, uh, you know, relatively sane, given the fact that some it, it, earlier in my life, that, that kind of thing would have driven me crazy. Yeah, so, exactly. Anyway. That's great. Um, Robert, can you talk to uh, a little bit of getting people in their body in the Digital Life Collective context of like virtual teams, virtual conversations, virtual groups that are popping up all over the place or open learning context, whatever. Have you thought about that in, in your work? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I, one thing I'd say is some of the spaces we're creating um, although they're not sort of super far in that direction where it feels like you're in the same room together, it sort of uh, is heading down that direction of being intentional about sort of maybe the, I know you're saying like get out of the cognitive and into the felt sense, but if, if you sort of provide a little bit of context of like, hey, this room means this, and maybe we can think about putting stuff up on the walls or something like that. Um, it sort of gives you a, a little bit more of a feeling. And um, yeah, I'm also interested in, in technology tools that we can use to sort of take that a little bit further. So um, there, there is, um, I don't know if any of you are aware of a friend of mine, Connor Turland, who work, worked on Metamaps, but he's sort of hacked together a, a little tool that um, uses some of the JavaScript libraries for sort of 3D, um, almost like real uh, first person shooter games, but it has this, you sort of walk around in it with, uh, as if your zoom sort of uh, webcam screen is like a billboard. So you're almost walking around with like a billboard face and then uh, has this potential to sort of drop in 3D objects and stuff like that. So I don't know, something, something like that would be interesting. Give you more of a feeling like uh, we're in a, a, a a room together that we can kind of co-design in some way. Thank you. The, actually, the one other thing I was going to mention was when you were talking about breathing was um, actually there's a little Google Easter egg if you search uh, breathing exercise, but um, something, uh, some sort of app that might work for sort of syncing up breath, I think is interesting. So it has like this, just this white circle that goes in and out. So it'd be interesting to sort of sync, sync up breath. Synchronizing exercises are really, really interesting. Um, <clears throat> it's a, there's a simple exercise where you stand in a circle uh, and you get, try to get the group to count to as, as many number. I, I think you have to try to get to 20, one person saying a number at a time and if two people jump in at the same moment, you have to start over. And, and it takes a lot of patience because, you know, you're, you're nobody, there's no cue about who leads or anything. You're, you, you, don't, you don't go around in a circle, nothing like that. It's like everybody jumps in. And then you put a coin in the middle of the, of the group and you put it like on the floor and you say, okay, everybody focus on the coin and do the same exercise. And it's much easier. Mm. It, it's somehow much easier. I don't know, but it worked. Um, so I, th I think there's many of these kinds of things that, that exist in the world, good you know, practices that people know. And, and partly I'm interested in building a nice bag of, of these sorts of modes and exercises and, and things that, that you might try and that anybody could try. Another, another way to make that easy, which I learned from um, being on conference calls with Craig Neal with the Heartland Institute, uh, you know, there'd be 50, 60 people on this teleconference call. And this is before Zoom, before all, it's just on the telephone, so you don't see anybody. And he'd open it up for questions and he would say, 
before you, when someone finishes speaking, feel your heart beat twice before you speak. And it was amazing because very rarely would two people actually speak at the same time. It, was, it created a space where the next person could just seamlessly move in and, and speak. And it was extremely rare that a couple of people would speak at the same time. Oh, excuse me. No, you go first. No, no, you go first. So uh, that feel your heart beat twice. Just I've used that for many different things since then. And I find it really useful for folks because again, it puts them in touch with their bodies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Christina. I have a question about that because I am me. <laughs> and um, some of my best friends are, are people who we end up having these conversations and they're very, very fast and we can interrupt each other. Like just, brup, 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 brup. and what it's doing is it's like, it's like Jerry with his brain, which you've seen, it's going, I need to add a tag here. It's not like interrupting. And, um, in working with, uh, somebody else who was, there was, there was a, a context where I, I was having one of those conversations and, realizing that the person that I was talking to was sort of the mapping Jedi thing. So we were, we were going back and forth in this very fast thing. And then another person in the context was feeling that I was being rude by interrupting because this thing was going on. And there was like this, this is categorically rude. You can't interrupt, period. It's a rule. And there was like a stringency around that. And and maybe it was because there were other people at the table. Maybe it was rude to do that like in front of people. But I, I just don't know how to navigate that very well because I need those conversations where I can totally interrupt my friends because they know what we're talking about. And there's like, because we have a limited time, we're trying to do stuff together. In so let the ninja run and, and let everybody level up. That's what I say. Yeah. <laughs> Bring your weapons. Like in, some, in some cultures, it's um, like in la a lot of Latin countries, but not all Latin countries, uh, there's, a, there's a constant acknowledgement from the listener. Like, aha, uh -huh, see, si, yep, got it, aha, uh -huh, vale. And, and it's happening every second sentence. It's, it's like really frequent. And it's, it's like the act signal back from the modem that says, like, got your signal. And if you don't do that, they're like, what, what, what's up? And in other cultures, if you make any noise at all, it's like insulting and, hey, I, I've got the floor, Why, what are you doing talking? Right? So I, I think that there's a lot of cultural, uh, there's, a, there's a cultural dimension to this that's interesting. But one, one reason why I love jazz hands um, and why I teach it whenever I give a speech or whatever else is that it allows for a sideband that's easily visible, that's not an attempt to take the floor. It's not meant to be disruptive or interruptive, although I think it occasionally can be. Um, but it gives it, and it changes it from speaker and audience to meaning makers sort of together where one person has the floor right now. And, and I like that a lot about it. So, so to me, uh, jazz hands is a, a tool in my basket of, of things. It's, it ain't, it ain't a sophisticated tool, but um, I have to confess it was a, an, it was an enlightenment to me when I discovered jazz hands because for retreats I've been running since 1996, I invented red and green cards. And I used to give everybody plastic cards this big that they could hold up during a meeting to say I agree or I disagree with what's being said with no intention of stopping the conversation. And then it's like, well, crap, we've, we've most, you know, we've got red, you know, green cards and red cards on board right now. Why don't we just use them all the time? And that's one reason why I like Zoom. And it's, this is, this is a, a nice little tweak on Zoom because it's one thing to have the Brady Bunch or it was it Brady Bunch or the Partridge family where they're all like in a matrix in the Brady Bunch. Brady Bunch. Thank you. I memory is poor on this. Partridge so family was uh, little partridges walking across the bottom of the screen. That's right. Okay. So, so Brady Bunch. So it's one thing to have the, like the Brady Bunch gallery view and see a lot of faces, but, but when you get more activity in, I think that livens things up a bit. And Ken, I really liked what you said earlier about, you know, how do we see more of our environment, more of us doing things, stand, move around, uh, do whatever. Uh, and I'm also very aware that lighting is really crucial to a good video conference. And, and I, I put up a page somewhere about how to be better on video just because most people don't know the basics of, of how to get there. And it's really hard to have a quiet enough room where you're not disturbing somebody, good enough lighting that you're visible, and then the mobility and the other things that you're talking about. Like, mm -hmm. how do you combine all of that so that it feels like you're more present as a whole person 
rather than a talking head. If I can respond to Christina for a moment. Um, this is one of the things that, that I believe came out of one of Google's projects, either Aristotle or Oxygen, where um, they're looking at what made for good teams. And something that really flummoxed them for a long time was this, uh, they discovered was actually norms, that, that you could be on two different teams. On one team, it was driven exactly as you're saying, where people would start to talk, and they'd, oh, let me jump in and they'd add to that, you know? And then other teams like, no, you have to wait until that person is done before you can speak. And um, both those teams would be high performing, but it was an agreed upon norm among the team. So when you've got, when you're talking with a friend where it's just easy like that, you do that all the time, it's one thing, you put add a third person, you need to actually talk about a norm and say, look, this is how we talk together. If that's too fast for you, we'll slow it down. And I, I'm of the, the I, I like to lean towards, I want to interrupt, I'm just sitting here on these calls. These are great disciplines for me to sit here and be quiet and not jump in, you know, because there's so many things I want to put a tag on, right? And there's great um, value in slowing things down. So uh, it, it's, it's always something that I think that's negotiated. And if the negotiations are done with, with, with good heart and goodwill, generally they work out pretty well. And if someone's just really stuck, well, you have to do this, that can be a problem because other people don't want to be that rigid. But when you've got somebody really rigid, how, that becomes a question of how do you, how do you norm when you have someone who's very, very rigid? And that's a whole different conversation. But most folks are pretty, you know, if you say this is what we do, that's what we do. And they're, they're pretty on board with it, I discover. So I would love to talk to you more. This, but like, when I know that that's the dynamic, I can do that. But the thing, the specific thing that I was talking about is that I was just meeting this person and we were recognizing in real time the way that each other's brains worked and starting to go into this path. Like when I met another mapper that had this kind of thing, he, when I saw him realize that I had that kind of brain, he paused. He said, oh, I can talk to you this way. And his rate of speech doubled, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it, was, it's, it may, may not repeat itself very many times, but it was specifically this thing that emerged at a conversation at a table with four people where two of us went into this different mode of speaking without really, I mean, I guess that's just a noticing that we're starting to do it. Because it wasn't like a, a thing I was expecting at all. It wasn't a team norm. We weren't a team yet. So one of my inter interview techniques, which isn't exactly what you're talking about, but, but right next door, um, was, because I'm curious about everything, and I, I know a little bit about a bunch of stuff. So in a new setting where it was some new domain and I was meeting a new person, I would ask a question or mention something that was kind of as far up the ladder of of knowing something about their field that as I could possibly do. I would basically aim really high and say, well, yeah, but that happened or, or whatever. And, and, and you could often see, oh, okay. So they understand that dynamic about my business or my, my, my environment. And they would shift to a different level of conversation comfortably and quickly. And, and so, so I learned that, you know, it was an opening gambit for me to aim pretty high in the realm of whatever the hell I knew about whatever they were up to that would transform the conversation. It worked, it worked a lot. And then I would often ha then have to race to catch up because they would then be saying things and mentioning things that I maybe had never heard of, didn't know very much about. So I was taking copious notes. Later, I'd go back and like follow up on some of those things so that I could learn more. But I then could treat each meeting like this as a little bit of grad school. So for me, you know, uh, every interaction like that taught me a whole, a whole bunch of things. We are three minutes away from 90 minutes of of our intro call. Uh, so I kind of just want to make room for any wrapping comments. What I'm going to do is I'll create another Inside Jerry's Bain call on uh, Apkido for next week. Uh, give everybody more time to put it on your schedules if you can. I'm sorry they're in the middle of the work week. Uh, it's kind of when I can, when I can put things and uh, we'll see where it goes. But maybe a, a quick go around for uh, thoughts about Apkido relative to our conversation. Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Christina? So, putting it back in the context of groups, the what do you call it? So, there's a, there's a, there's a mindfulness that is seen as individual mindfulness. 
and uh, Jeremy Lent in his, I actually put the podcast episode in the chat a while back, um, the Emerge podcast that Daniel Thorson interviewed Jeremy Lent, who wrote The Patterning Instinct, was talking about cultural mindfulness and mindfulness as a group. What does that mean? And in the dynamic we were just talking about, perhaps recognizing sort of the direction of the spiral of somebody else's comfort level and where their own capabilities and comfort zones are so that you're not, I kind of felt like an UK or, or, or in a, on the mat in the Aikido metaphor, you, you're basically like putting a white belt in a place where they are in a little bit of danger. They're not, they're like, you don't want to get them hurt. You do want to push them up against the edge of their learning, but you don't want to get them hurt. So in the social dynamic where my friend felt I was being rude, there's like, it was like, it was like training with a couple of black belts that are going too fast for your, what you're doing right now. And so being able to have mindfulness, include mindfulness of the dynamic in the group, include like, not just I'm going to focus on my breath, but I'm going to focus on whether the person next to me is breathing. Thank you. And, and I'm also thinking about what you just said in the context of a zoom call, right? And, and, you know, how to pay attention to who's, who's doing what and, and what's going on. And it's, it, it, it's challenging, but sort of, in, in some in some respects, sort of doable. Anybody else thoughts? Ken. Um, another practice that we had when I was spent my years working with Monday and David at the World Cafe was we would periodically every three or four months um, gather some folks together and we'd sit in 10, 15 minutes of silence with the question, if the World Cafe had a voice, what would it be telling us right now? which is part of the principle of listening into the center. You know, what's, if there's one voice in this conversation, what is it, what's it speaking to us? And I think that's another useful thing to do on, um, in groups is periodically stop and say, okay, so what's emerging here? What's, you know, if there's, if there's some theme or some voice that, that is a deeper voice that's speaking through many different people, what is that saying? What's, what's, what's here? So, um, and I have a really short poem, if you want, I could close with when you're ready to actually close. It's a pretty cool poem. So, I know you're usually open with them, but I thought I'd offer them to close. That's lovely. Judy? Uh, I'm just thinking that the mindfulness key is central to all of this and to really what is the up of a pedo, but there's practice and discipline. And I think my language doesn't match some people's language on the topic, but if we could, on a subsequent call, separate it into conscious divisions of dimension. You know, what, what do I do? What do I invite another person to do? What do I, what works in a group? Because getting to group mindfulness, which is sort of peak performance zone, peak connection zone, is what it's all about. But each person is at a very different place. And some groups are open to a physical approach to it. Um, in a typical corporate meeting room, collective breathing would be met with a great deal of skepticism. Um, but there are other pauses that can have similar effect. And I'd be interested to sort of explore those different zones a little bit systematically if it's not, but not restrictively systematically. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I did some work with um, Suncorp uh, in Australia in 2015. And toward the end of my time working with them, we would have a bunch of calls using like stupid links, you know, terrible video conferencing uh, technology. But, but in the biggest room, they had a practice that had shown up where they would take an iPhone and do like a six minute um, meditation before the meeting. And they'd put the iPhone next to the speakerphone and everybody would sit back and, and I was like, whoa, this is super interesting. And it, it helped. I don't know that it helped a whole bunch, but it was, it, to me, it was fascinating that it was happening in a large Australian corporation. Um, so, I, I, so I think that the door is not open much, but the door occasionally opens to interesting practices like that. And again, if we can have a, a variety of practices, that could be super, super useful. Thank you. Uh, Robert, Mike, any thoughts? Sure, I can go. Um... 
I'm excited that there'll be another Upkeeto call. I'm sorry I was a little late, but I guess my context for it is more Brazilian jiu-jitsu, although I haven't done much of it. Um, the one thing I shared a link in the channel, and maybe this is a can of worms I can open up on the next call, but um, it's something to look into is this concept of game shifting, uh, which we could potentially develop further together. But um, it's this idea that groups in conversation can make their sort of form intentional and explicit and that we can maybe visualize that on a board or something and maybe be polymorphic and intentionally flow from one sort of state to another. So maybe one of those states is two black belts rolling on the mat and we're just observing or something like that. And so yeah, maybe just bring that up for next time. So I love that. And uh, Arthur Brock did some game shifting for a Rex meeting I held uh, once in Austin and he was using a whiteboard to do things. And I was struck uh, that this would make really interesting iPad software for meetings. That, that letting people see which protocol we're using right now, what's next in the agenda, where are we in our little journey, uh, et cetera, et cetera, would be super cool uh, and interesting. So I'd, I'd love to create an open source package that does game shifting uh, and, and figure that out. So, um, I love that idea, Robert. Thank you. Uh, Mike, any thoughts? No, just uh, thank you for a fascinating discussion. This is quite different than a lot of the normal topics that you've covered in the past. So look forward to hearing more in future talks. Glad my schedule Sounds worked. Great. Sounds great. Uh, yeah, th thank you for being here. Really, uh, really appreciate it. Um, and I do have to show you one other, one other of my favorite Japanese prints. This is not one of the classics. <laughs> But can you see that one? Yes. It's lovely. It's a, it's a mountain village up in the um, up in northern northern Japan. So beautiful. Oh, it's lovely. And and, and I saw a post recently that um, went into the Great Wave of Kanagawa Hokusai's uh, print and showed that he did that same scene like at least four times in his life, and each time it gets more dramatic. It, you can see the lifetime shift of his forms of expression. It's really genius. And the last one is like, boom. Uh, but the first one is sort of like, hey, beach scene with a wave. He did exactly that same scene because that's part of the series of views of Mount Fuji. But he did that same Correct. scene from that same angle. He did that same scene from that same, basically that composition. He okay. did at least four times. I've got the images. I downloaded them to my to my drive. So, uh, Actually, just for, for half a second before Ken and Poem, let me go to, uh, so Hokusai, here's the Great Wave off Kanagawa, and here's why the Great Wave is Mr. Mystified Art Lovers. Shoot, I thought I had put the, the, the different versions, the, wherever that article was here, but I guess I didn't. Ah, brain they failed. They had an amazing exhibit of his work at the Smithsonian about eight or nine years ago. Cool. Got the t-shirt. Nice. <laughs> Ken, we have an umbrella with a great wave on it. How's that? Um, and I think April has a tote bag too. Ken, please. There's, there's actually a meme going around on Facebook right now of the great wave filled with plastic trash, which mm. is you know, a poignant and powerful statement. Okay, so William Stafford is one of my favorite poets. So I have a couple of his poems committed to memory and this one is called Ultimate Problems. And so Ultimate Problems says, in the Aztec design, God is in the little P that is rolling out of the bottom of the picture, and the rest extends all the bleaker because God has gone away. In the white man's design, there is no P. God is everywhere, but hard to see. The Aztec frowns at this. How do you know that he's everywhere? And how did he get out of the P? Sweet. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Thank you. Uh, William Stafford. Stafford, who, who I know. But what's the name of the poem? Ultimate Problems. It's the most succinct course in comparative religion I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> sweet. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everybody.
this has been a treat. I will uh, put up a session for next week and we'll dive a little deeper into Upkeeto. If you want edit privileges on upkeeto.com, I'll, up, I'll fix up the 404. If you want to be able to edit that, let me ping me on email and I'll add you to the list and we'll go from there. Thank you. Nice to meet all the new folks. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend, everyone. You Ciao. Too.